God is good. All the time. And all the time? God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for today, for your word, for snow. Psalm 147 says that you, you spread the snow and you cover the earth, and yet you send your word and it melts. Mm. Thank you, O Father. You control the time. You control the seasons. You control our hearts, and in you we will not be shaken. Lord, I, I, I present myself and, and these, these people here that you've, you've given uh, as charge to give them meat in due season. Father, I pray that the words are not just pablum. I pray that the words are not just cereal fluff, cotton candy, mush. Holy God, I pray that I would be faithful delivering your meat in due season, that it would strengthen them, fire them, encourage them to kick the devil in the teeth. Jesus, 1 John 3, 7 says, you came to destroy the works of the devil. Father, may we do as we see our Jesus do. May we imitate Christ. Oh God, may we do with what you've given us and not shirk the road that is laid before us knowing that there's an empty tomb afterwards that says our Savior is alive. Lord Jesus, you are our God. Amen. You are our mercy. Yeah. You are our judge and our high tower. We love you. We bless you. Thank you for dying on the cross and ra being raised from the dead for us yes. and, and showing us and equipping us to get more people off this ship called Earth, this Titanic that's sinking. Lord, let us not rearrange the deck chairs here, but let us save souls. In Jesus' name, In Jesus amen. amen. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 All right, so, uh, this is a, First Corinthians 7, let's just, Enough with prefacing and just 1 Corinthians 7. And uh, if you haven't read it, it's part of your, should be part of your library. The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody who doesn't know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, raise your hand. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor during World War II. Um, Adolf Hitler, he was in Germany. He was highly educated, uh, very gifted. And he had the opportunity of lifetimes to leave, spare his life, because he spoke out against Adolf Hitler. He because Adolf Hitler would remove all things Jewish in the Bible, including that Jesus was Jewish, change the book of Revelation, and a whole, make his own, essentially, the German Nazi church and get the, the Christians on board, quote-unquote, on board. And Bonhoeffer said, absolutely not. We're Christians. The state should never wield both swords. The sword for judgment and the sword of the church. Never. It has too much power. And um, he knew what was going on. And he went to... Uh, he went to England. He went to the United States. To Spain. And he was offered to stay. And he says, I can't do it. Um... He said that, why should I have the privilege and take the luxury of safety while my country is suffering under tyranny? Who's going to speak up for what's right and be willing to pay the price? In the book, he says, when Christ bids to call a man, he bids him to come and die. He says, grace without cost is cheap. 
The reason why it is called grace is because it cost God his life and every last drop of blood for you. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's so costly, because it cost the Son of God everything. And to diminish the blood of Jesus or the cross is to make grace cheap. This man walked the walk. And he talked it. He talked the talk and walked the walk. How do I know? Because he was a spy as well. He said, if we sit back, and he, he, he struggled. If we sit back and watch evil happen as good men doing nothing, then we will be just as guilty as those men who are evil to committing the act. So he ferried documents and information. They found him out, threw him in jail, found more, and uh, he was part of an assassination attempt. He was providing information. When Hitler, the assassination attempt failed the third time, Hitler walked away without scratches. It was when there was a, a failed bombing. His name was found. Heinrich Himmler personally signed his name to execute him. And, uh, and he ministered in, in prison as well. And he could have had an opportunity to escape prison from the, the guards providing ways of escape. He said, no, I will go through. I will not compromise. I will not back off of my beliefs. And I'll tell you this. It was for the name of Jesus Christ, and he was very clear about it. And he stood up. He, he actually started the German Confessing Church for the sole purpose of standing up against the state church, which compromised. Compromised the Bible. Essentially rewrote the Bible. And he was hanged two weeks before Adolf Hitler committed suicide. He was... There was a doctor watching him go to the gallows. And he said, never before have I seen someone so submitted to the will of God. Which will bring to my message, the message. And he was asked, is this the end? Don't copy me. Shh. And he said, no, this is just the beginning. So, where does that leave us? 1 Corinthians 7 Verse 17. However, each one must live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him. This is what I command in all the churches. I'm not going to get into these debates of matters of law. No, that, that's not. And I'll get to that. Was anyone already circumcised when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Was anyone called? He, while uncircumcised, he should not get circumcised. Circumcision, circumcision doesn't matter. And uncircumcision doesn't matter. Here's what, and I'm going to address people who have gone into Hebrew roots and whatnot. But keeping God's commands does. Oh, well, it goes to, no. If you stick to the law, you're going to get the sting of the law, which is death. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to make these words come alive. You need the Holy Spirit to understand what God's command is for your life. What's good for the goose is not for the gander. I heard of a story, uh, a, friend, a friend of a friend, that the Lord told him, get circumcised. He was an adult. He was in his 40s, 50s. And I don't think he was able physically, like, through the doctors or whatnot to do it for some reason. I don't remember all the details. But what I do remember is he said, Lord, you're going to have to show me how to do this. And he did it himself, upon himself. And I believe after it was all done, he went before a physician. And I believe that physician was a mohel who did circumcisions, he says, never before in my life have I seen such a professional circumcision. God commanded him to do that as a matter of faith. And God can command a person not to. But the purpose is, where are you? In what station have you been called? Are you embracing the cross for your life? Do you think it was easy for him to make that decision? No. But he went knowing full well that was his cross. Let's go on. 
Each person should remain in the life situation in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? It should be not a concern to you. But if you can become free, by all means, take the opportunity. And some may say to remain a slave. That way you can preach. For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called a free man is Christ's slave. You're bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brothers, each person should remain with God in whatever situation he was called. Folks, this is what the Lord is trying to communicate. He's reading in Bonhoeffer, in, in this book. He was talking about the visible community. And he says this. That the visible church, he's talking about Acts. And I believe we're, going, we're, we're, we're coming into this. The visible church, with its perfect common life, invades the world and robs it of its children. The daily growth of the church is a proof of the power of the Lord who dwells in it. He asked prior, this infant church was a visible community which all the world could see. And strange to say, they had favor with all the people. Acts 2.47. Uh, was this due to the blindness of Israel, which could not see that the secret of this common life was the cross of Christ. Folks, this is what the Lord is trying to drive home. I can only ask the questions. Where are you in your life where you want to go everywhere else but the cross where is right before you? Mm -hmm. Let me read this hymn. My favorite. Jesus, I, my cross, have taken. He says this, verse uh, one, two, three, four, five. Soul, then know thy full salvation. Rise o'er sin and fear and care. Joy to find in every station. Something still to do or bear. Think what spirit dwells within you. Think what father's smiles are yours. Think that Jesus died to win you. Child of heaven can sour repine. The cross is that which we cling to. God's command from the beginning, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. I'm going to address this issue of discontent. Let's call sin, sin. Breaking the 10th commandment. You're discontent? You're not happy where you are? I'm sorry, you just broke the 10th commandment. You want something that's not yours. You want a place that's not your own. You want to have your own business, and yet you are still stuck in, a, in a, working for someone else? Sorry, discontent. You're grumbling against the Lord. You want something that's not yours. God said, I didn't give that to you. It's not your responsibility. Lord, I just want to be done with these hindrances and, and self-employment because there, there are a lot of challenges being self-employed. He says, I didn't give that to you. I gave you charge over people, over finances, over resources. Why do you want a place that's not yours? Lord, I want to be single and just travel the world. But, but, but child, I have precious stones, precious jewels. I want you to raise up children, a wife, a husband. Lord, I need a spouse, child. You are caring about the world's things when you're married. Do you understand what a burden it is to have a spouse? Because now your concern is for that spouse. Child, where I put you, the cross is there. When you cling to the cross, come all hell against you. And the devil can't touch you because you're clinging so tightly to that instrument of death. Where you say, I don't care, devil. I have got nothing to lose. The devil can throw all of hell at you, and the and Jesus and, and, and Psalm, excuse me, Psalm. Go to Psalm. Uh, sixteen. Um, uh, eight. Is it? 
I keep the Lord in my mind, or rather in front of me. The Lord is ever before me, always, because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. The scripture says, Psalm 18, the Lord, verse 2, the Lord is my rock. He was on that cross, nothing shake, shook him. Folks, quit trying going to somewhere else other than a cross. It's right there. Joy to find it at every station. That thing you don't want to do, I'm sorry. Let, let, let me, can I speak? Now, I'm, I'm ex-military. Can I speak a little frank with you? Suck it up. Can, can it get more raw than that? Just Don't just suck it up, grin and bear it. Enjoy it. If you say, Erez, I can't do that. Exactly. No, you can't do that, not humanly speaking. What does it say? Verse 11, Psalm 16, 11. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. In your right hand are eternal pleasures. Are you in his presence every day? Jesus says, John 10, 10. I come that you may have life and life more abundant. Are you in that abundant life? Are you in his presence? Is the Lord ever before you? Is your life a fragrant offering of prayer? Are you always... There is a way when you can pray without ceasing. How? Get rid of your petty tasks. Well, I got to do this. I got to do that. Really? If you are starting to fret and be anxious and you, you feel like you're, you're walking in thorns and thistles, you all know that feeling in your heart. You're like, ah! You just want to come out of your skin. I'm sorry. I was combat engineers. We had this material called concertina wires, a big coil. Uh, it was tight wire. But on the end of the wire, it, little razor blades, I mean, they're that thin, and it, there's, it's like a blade and then space, this space, and it's, it's like razor wire. And if you get on it, the more you try to get out, the more you're like cut up in it. I mean, that's the sole purpose. It's an obstacle. Does not God surround you behind it before? He hems you in, a thorny bush. So just, just suck it up. You're in a concertina, and you should just stop. He's right behind you. Surrender and say, Lord, okay, I can't get out of this. I need you to get me out of this. And watch what he does. He does. He literally pulls you out of it. He cuts your clothing and gives you new clothes. The imagery is rife here. And then he will literally guide your path. But folks, you've got to embrace that difficult thing that you, you, you've been putting it off. You know who you are. You've been putting it off. You don't want to look at it. You don't want to see it. You wish it'd just go away. And he says, I'm sorry, child. It's not going to go away. Forgive that person who's hurt you. Go apologize. Your pride's got to die on the cross. It died on the cross. Agree with me that it did. But stop holding on. Stop holding on to decaying matter. When you agree with pride, when you hold on to it, guess what? I'm sorry. You are holding on to rotting flesh. You're holding on to that roadkill. Stop. Say, okay, Lord, it's, it's, it's roadkill. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for holding on. Wash me. And get baptized. Get cleansed. Because he wants to deal with you. He wants holiness from you. You're not ready to fulfill the Lord's duty. His task. Until you let go. And, and that is a cross. What is that cross? Dealing with everyday life. Dealing with the commonplace. Dealing with a really difficult family member. Dealing with hurt. Dealing with abuse. Dealing with loneliness. We have a, a brother who has to go um, for, he's got to go away for about a month. And uh, a place that was not in his control, but he submitted to it. I believe the Lord will use him greatly. But he needs prayer. And he's got to face it. And he's got to walk through this trial. We've got to pray for him. But also, Bonhoeffer says that wherever we are, whatever we do, 
Everything happens, quote unquote, in the body. In the church, in Christ. The Christian is strong or weak, in Christ. He works and rejoices in the Lord. He speaks and admonishes in Christ. He shows hospitality in Christ. He marries in the Lord. He is in prison in the Lord. He is a slave in the Lord. Among Christians, a whole range of human relationships is embraced by Christ and the church. Folks, this is about eternity. I'm no better than any one of you. I could at any point be approached by any one of you and say, Erez, you know, you, the Lord brought something up and, uh, and, and you and I need to talk. And I'll say, okay, please, because I can't see myself and I need help. Okay? We're, we're in a new era of society. There's, I love what Jesus says. He says that the Gentiles and the rulers of this earth lord it over you, but not so you. We should all be as brothers serving one another. No one is greater than the next. We are all bound by the Holy Spirit and by the blood of Jesus. We should all have the blood of Jesus running through our spiritual veins. Psalm 17, verse 15, uh, 14. With your hand, Lord, save me from men. And he talks about the wicked. Save me from wicked men. And the wicked are the ones who call themselves, oh yes, the Lord is on my heart. And yet they don't ever bother to embrace the difficult things and walk through these trials and tribulations and seek to go through them. He says, with your hand, Lord, save me from men. From men of, what's it say? Men of the world, whose portion is in this life. Amen. Their portion better not be here, guys. Amen. You guys have got to understand, you're not Amen. living for here. You guys have got to understand, your flesh is failing. Yes. You're going to die. 100% of you here are going to die. 100%. Or are you going to pay taxes? Either one. <laughs> Two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin. Y'all, we All of us. What are you storing for eternity? Wood? Hay? Stubble. Gold? Silver? Precious gems. Don't say, Jesus, I want to bring someone to your kingdom. That's a good desire. Great. Ask him. Don't you start going out. Yes. The, the Great Commission tells us to go and make disciples as you're going. Tell them of the goodness of the Lord. Psalms. It says, I will speak the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, you fill their bellies with what you have in store. Their sons are satisfied and they leave their surplus to their children. But what are we going to do? Guys, let's read this aloud, and our versions may be different. Verse 15. But I will see your face in righteousness. When I awake, I will be satisfied with your presence. Do you see Jesus every day? You want to know how you see Jesus? You grab the cross. You grab a hold of it and say, I don't care. I'm going down with it. And guess what? There's an empty tomb at the end of that. Now the Holy Spirit comes. Because it's spirit of, the Spirit of God who raised up Christ will raise you up Amen. also. Amen. Give you new life. And guess what? You'll have another cross. Don't worry. You can only go to that second cross when you're done with the first. You're never going to get away from that first one. I worked with a guy, brutal, abusive. He was nasty. No one would work with him. And I told my foreman, my general foreman, he was the foreman. I was an apprentice uh, as a carpenter. He's like, well, we can move you somewhere else. I said, okay, yeah. And uh, this guy, former alcoholic, hated night shift, two bad knees. Uh, he was a foreman, and he, his wife was undergoing her third bout of cancer treatments for breast cancer. She eventually passed away. Oh my goodness, he was abusive. And uh, everyone knew it. And the Lord quietly told, it's almost like he could just do this and just shake his head. 
He says, son, you know I'm going to put him back, put you back with him. I said, Lord, can you put, he said, son, no, you know you're not going to run away from this. Not only am I sending you back, you're not leaving until I teach you and you learn everything that I want you to learn. Mm. It was a miracle I didn't throw a hammer at him. There was one time, uh, I mean, he was always yelling at me. You stinking a print! I mean, he just was abusive. He, uh, and he would yell and abuse me in front of everybody. And, and everyone knew it. And they, they kept said, folks told me, why don't you knock his block off? Like, people don't understand if he did. They would say you snapped or whatever. I said, no, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I can't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. And uh, there was one time he, uh, I said, Lord, how do I get this piece of trim in there? And he said, quit talking to the devil and get it up there. I put my stuff down. I turned around. I said, I am talking to my Jesus. Now you back off. And he sort of slinked away. Uh because he called himself a Christian. <laughs> uh, last night, uh, not last night, but the, the, the very last night I worked with him, this happened years ago. I was on top of a 40 foot, 50 foot height. Uh, it was two stories and then another 30 feet on the scaffold. We we're putting material to cover up uh, the scaffold and he's pulling on it and I'm just about gonna fall over. And I said, get off this job, you are a safety hazard. And we went back and forth, and I worked in my lunch, and then and I just said, Lord, I can't take this anymore. But I'll do it still. And I would constantly do wrong, say, Jerry, I'm sorry. He never forgave me. He was just always quiet, but I kept saying, I'm sorry. He would always come to me and talk to me, and be all chipper and cheerful. Come to work, he was nasty. But uh, that, that last night, after lunch break, I said, Jerry, I'm sorry. I yelled at you and I was angry. He said, Erez, I'm sorry too. I apologize. I was frustrated and I need you to forgive me. I put my arm around him and said, Jerry, I love you. I forgive you. Next night, you're done. Go to Epcot. I never saw him again. God told me, congratulations. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You didn't give up. Folks, don't give up. Do not give up. You're going to get crosses. You're going to get losses. Go ahead and take a risk. Whatever the Lord's calling you to do, jump head first and grab that cross. Because when you fall, I mean, assuming... This assumes a lot that you've sought him diligently in prayer. She does yeah. this all the time. You have. And there's no other way to go but that direction. Take it. Uh, who is it? Yogi Berra would say, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. I say this, if you come to a cross in the road, take it. Take it. Because there's an empty tomb. There's an empty tomb. But don't go until God calls you. Do as he says. The gospel is the general order. His individual command is the specific order, special order, as we say in the military. There is joy to find in every station. The cross is there anywhere you look. But when you hold on to it, no demon or devil in hell can, can shake you. Because if Jesus says in uh, Colossians that your life is hid with Christ and God, and he's the rock. Guess what? Whoop! I hide myself in him. Guess what? You become as a rock, immovable. You are one with him. You can't move. You can't be shaken. Let the devil fire you. Let him steal your retirement. Let him take every inheritance you have. Let him take your house. Let him take your kids. I don't live for here. He's going to say, Arr! He says, you frustrate me. Psalm 146. Let's go to Psalm 146. I was working one day, having my lunch, 
and I was just in worship and in praise. I went to read my psalm. Was it 146, I believe? I thought it was 147. And I just kept, I just kept, uh, kept at it. I said, I don't care. I've been written up before. I've been fired before. I can't. I'm dead. You can't take anything from me. I'm already gone. Psalm 146, verse 9. The Lord protects foreigners, helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Can the devil say that about you? You frustrate me! Can he? Are you known in hell? Yes. Do the demons say, oh yeah, I, I know, yeah, I know Kelvin, I know Jen, yeah, I know them, they frustrate me, I know Paul, I know Jesus, I know John, I know Nathaniel, I know them, do you want to be known in hell? Then you better cling to that cross and go down with it, because you'll rise with it afterwards. Don't worry about now. Don't worry about here. This world's fading. Embrace the cross. Find joy in every station. Remember, wherever you are, that's where the cross is. Wherever, right now, today, go before him in the morning. Lord, where is the cross today? The more you embrace, the more resurrection power comes out. And it's quick. It happens. Because he takes you through that cross and you come out with a song and peace. And you will find yourself flying. Amen? Amen? Father, I pray that whatever these words that you've given me to deliver, however imperfectly, Jesus, your word does not, reti uh, does not return void, but it gives us life and life eternal. We love you, and we bless you, and we praise you. <sighs> Sanctify us, O God. Purify our hearts, that we may walk in truth. <sighs> Jesus, we pray for all, for all those listening right now. We ask that your blood cover us, that to the outsiders they see a people touched of God. In Jesus' name, let your hand be heavy upon us. Lord, let us not, the words we speak, be useless. Help us with our children. Help us with our employers, with our employees, with our families, with the holidays coming up. Help us, O oh God. Lord, we don't know how to navigate through this life. With each age, with each year, it gets more challenging. Jesus, I pray that we would not give up. Even when we are faithless, we have this hope that you remain faithful because you cannot deny yourself. The reason why you can't deny yourself is because you dwell in these mortal vessels. We love you, Jesus. We give you honor. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.